thank you for welcoming and greeting each other. Let me, one thing I forgot to do, first service and this service. If you look over here, there's a lot of cool things over there. We have collected those over the years. I do think it's been years. And uh, we would encourage you to go over when we're done with our service and peruse through. If any of it's yours, please take it. I'm actually at the point now that even if it's not yours and you like it, I'm not going to watch. I'll turn my eye because after another week or so, it's going to go to Love Inc. anyway. So, uh, but please, if any of that is yours, please take it. And uh, we'd love to clear out our lost and found so we can collect some more stuff over the years to come. That would be great. <laughs> uh, have you ever thought about what it is you know in life that you have absolute confidence in and how that enables you to live your life? H how does that help you function? Uh, some of the things I know since I've lived in Wisconsin now 10 years is that when the Packers lose a game, the fans think they should win, the world falls apart. And there's pretty much confidence that it's a lost season and it's hopeless and we should get rid of Aaron Rodgers and the coach and start over and it's all doom and gloom. Uh, I also know some other things that uh, it's helpful to know what's in my refrigerator. I know what's in there, so I know what I have for dinner tonight or lunch this afternoon or whether I need to go to the store and buy some food. Uh, I know how much money is in my bank account, so I can plan whether I need to buy food or got to wait a little bit or what bills need to be paid and how all that's going to be taken care of. Uh, I know what my responsibilities at my job are, my work here, uh, what I'm expected to do. It helps me be productive and effective and efficient in how I use my time. Uh, I, I, the other night, uh, yesterday, Millie went with a friend to a skating rink in town trackside for, I don't know what it was, but I knew she was going with these people and where she was going and enabled me to let her go and have some freedom. I will admit, as I was thinking about this, that she's just like seven now, what's that going to be like when she's 17? There may be a slightly different angst level going on there, but nonetheless, I knew where she was and who she was with. I trusted them and I was able to let her go and enjoy herself in that time. And one of the other more important things that I know, really important things that I know, is that my wife loves me and is there for me, and that enables me to truly trust her and enjoy life together with her. Uh, these are just some of the things that I've thought about as being critical for me to be able to know from some of the mundane things, like what's in my refrigerator, to the most critical things, like that my spouse loves me and cares for me. And it's with this knowledge that I'm able to wake up every day and go about my life and do the things that I need to do. And I'm sure that's true for you as well, that there's many things that we know that enable us to succeed in life and do what needs to be done and enjoy life and face the challenges uh, that we go through. And the same is true in our relationship with God. In fact, we're coming to the end of our time in the study in 1 John, and it struck me, as many others have, have talked about over the years, that 1 John really is a book about knowing. It's about what we can know about God, what we can know about having a relationship with God, and how that changes and transforms our lives and enables us to enjoy God and being in relationship with Him and live in the life that we have. And so this morning, as we conclude our time in 1 John, we're going to go through sort of his conclusion of the book, his literary conclusion, if you will, as he is writing his final thoughts to this church that he has been writing to. And in a sense, John is really summarizing many of the principles and the truths that he has talked about throughout his letter. And so we're going to look at some of these wonderful truths that we can know because of our faith in Jesus Christ. As I was putting this sermon together, it sort of struck me that it's a little bit like a television show clip show. Do you know what I'm talking about there? If you've watched the show over the years, sometimes they come to a point, and I don't know why they do this, maybe the writers are tired, and they just throw in a bunch of old clips and they build sort of a story around it to remind you of how much fun you've had watching this television show. Well, this is in essence John's version of the clip show, the final sort of statement of what have I been talking about, what does it mean? And so we're going to look through lots of texts this morning. Now, I'm going to do something abnormal, that I'm not going to put them all on the screen, because there's a lot of them. So I'm just going to work through them, but if you would like my notes, you're welcome to have them uh, in the future. Uh, but let me just say, we're going to look at uh, 1 John chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 18 to 21, his final statements here in 1 John. So turn there if you would, if you have your Bibles, 1 John 5, the Pew Bible, the red book in front of you there, it's page 864. John is in a process here, actually you could probably say he starts this off in verse 13, but he picks up this idea of what we know again in verse 18. And what he wants to bring home to us first and foremost is that as Christians, we know that because of our faith in Jesus, we're children of God and we are safe from Satan's harmful ways. In 1 John 5, 18 to 19, John is talking to us here, writing, he's saying that faith in Christ make us safe as God's children, and it changes how we live. He says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe. There, 
there, the one who was born of God is talking about Jesus, keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. John writes here, he says, what do we know first? We know first that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. And so he's reaffirming the fact, of, uh, an idea he has talked through throughout this book about how faith in Christ changes how we live. It changes what we do, what we think, what we say, how we act. It should do that because Christ has transformed us. We have become born of God, as John says. And he's reaffirming this truth that when we trust in Christ, we turn from sin and rebellion against God, and we are in process of maturing in our faith. In fact, this idea of not continuing in sin uh, alludes back to 1 John chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, where he's talking about how because of our relationship with Christ, we desire to become like Christ. And he says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. John here is talking about the fact that we look to Christ and he is pure and perfect and holy and righteous. And when we trust in him, we have a new longing and a desire to become like him. And so he goes on to say in verse 4 of chapter 3, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And he focuses in on this word lawlessness. What does it mean to be lawless? To be lawless means that you are not under law, right? You are rebelling against the law. In this context, the law here is God's word, his truth, his principles, his commands on how we are to live our lives. But it's even broader than that because the person who is lawless when it comes to God is a person who's basically saying, I'm not going to submit to God. I don't want to be in relationship with God. I'm not going to follow God's commands and ways and purposes. I don't really care about God. In fact, I will live unto myself and unto my own ways, and I'll make my own rules, and I'll do it the way I want to do it. And so John is saying that, listen, everyone who sins breaks the law because sin is lawlessness. And he goes on in verse 5 to say, But you know that he appeared, Jesus, so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. When we talked about this verse in the past, what we camped on was this idea that no one who lives on him keeps on sinning in the sense of saying, I don't care about God anymore. I'm lawless. I'm outside of God's concern. I will do this my own way. Instead, the person who knows Christ has said to God, look, I need you in my life. I recognize I have lived a lawless life. I recognize I have lived apart from you. And I want to trust in you. And I want to become like you. And now when the Christian who submitted to God in his life sins, he turns to the Lord and doesn't say, oh, that doesn't matter. I don't care. He turns to the Lord and says, that matters. I shouldn't have done that. God has told me that is wrong. That's destructive to my relationship with him. That's destructive to my ability to love my fellow man and my fellow Christian. And so, Lord, I will confess that sin. I will turn it over to you, and I, I acknowledge it's not right. And, Lord, I want to become more like you in how I handle my life and the decisions I make and the things that I do. And so in John, back to chapter 5 here, he starts off and he encourages us, and he says, what do we know? We know that those who are born of God do not continue to sin. They are becoming transformed to become more like Jesus. They're no longer sinning in the sense of lawlessness that they turn to the Lord and say, no, I want to be like you. I want to follow you. And we're not going to do that perfectly in this life, but there is going to be a desire and a longing to become more like Christ. There is going to be evidence of a change and a transformation that we are becoming more like Jesus in our lives. And so John, as he's reviewing what he has talked about, he points us back to this idea of life transformation that happens for the Christian, that we become more like Christ. We do not continue to sin in the way we did before when we were lawless. Now we desire and long to be like Christ. He goes on here to say uh, that we know that, no, that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. And here's one of the primary reasons why. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. He's playing on this idea of born of God. In the first half of this, we're the ones born of God. Now he says the one who was born of God keeps him safe. Who is the one that was born of God? He's talking about the unique, only begotten Son of God, Jesus, who was born of God. 
He is the one who keeps us safe. Well, how exactly does Jesus keep us safe? Well, there's several ways we've seen throughout this book. We're safe first and foremost because Jesus comes to bring us eternal life, to bring us eternal safety, if you will, to bring us into relationship with God. John declared this in 1 John 1, 2, the life appeared, talking about Jesus, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We're safe because Jesus came to do his Father's will, and his Father's will is that we would have eternal life, which is to know God and be in relationship with him. The way in which that happens, John talks about as well, that we're safe because Jesus purifies us from sin because of his sacrifice for us. And John, 1 John 1, 7, he says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. We're safe because Jesus purifies us. His blood, his sacrifice, cleanses us from sins, enables us to be in relationship with God. He goes on a little bit later in chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, to talk about this in particular. And he says we're safe for two reasons. One, Jesus continually and eternally intercedes for us before the Father. And secondly, he is the atoning sacrifice, or he is a propitiation for our sins. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice or the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Why are we safe? Well, we're safe because Jesus intercedes for us. What's he talking about here? Sort of a picture of how is it that Jesus' blood is continually purifying? How is it Jesus' blood continually is effective to bring us and keep us in relationship with God? Because Jesus is the one in partnership with the Lord that says, I died for him. I died for her. They're your children because I am the one that was a sacrifice for them. And he talks about he was the atoning sacrifice. I use the theological word propitiation. What does it mean? It means that he took God's wrath in our place. And so in essence, God, in his love for us, steps into our place and takes his own punishment for us so we'll never have to, folks. We're safe because it's been paid. And so we're safe because we have eternal life. That eternal life comes because we're purified. That eternal life comes because Jesus intercedes eternally and that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. We're safe as well because Jesus destroys the devil's work that keeps us from eternal life. In 1 John 3, 8, he says, He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God, the reason Jesus appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What is the devil's work to keep us lawless, to keep us opposed to God, separated from God, apart from God, that we might end eternally separated from God? But Jesus came to destroy that work of the devil, to bring people into relationship with God through faith in him, that they might become children of God in relationship, safe with him. And we're safe because of the motivation in which God did all of this, is that he loves us completely and fully according to 1 John 4, 9, and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice, that propitiation for our sins. Folks, we're safe because your creator loves you completely. You're safe because your creator did everything he had to do in order to bring you into relationship with him. And so John, as he's concluding his time in this letter, he reminds them, listen, we are safe in Christ because of his love for us. John all goes on to say that through faith in Christ, we know that we're children of God. And although we live in this hostile world under control of the devil, we will be safe in Christ. He goes on to write, um, and the evil one cannot harm him. Why? We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. What is John talking about here, world? He's not talking about the physical world as much as he's talking about this theological concept of world, which is the reality of all of those human beings and demons that are opposed to God, that in a sense live in that lawless position, that lawless state before God, that they have said, no, we will do this apart from God, separated from him according to our own will and our own ways. That is the world that wars against God, that wars against submitting to him and following his ways. And John's honest with us. Listen, we live in a dangerous place. We live in a world that is not submitted to God, that does not want to follow God. The devil is the head of it. But the reality is because of Jesus Christ, we are safe in the world. 
It reminds us of 1 John 2, 15 and 16, where, where John writes about this world. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's setting up a, a, a opposites here. He says, listen, you can't love both the world that is opposed to God and God. Why is that? He goes on to say, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has done and does, what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so the reality is, is that there's two opposites here. One cannot both love the world that is opposed to God and love God himself. And so when we trust in Christ, what happens? We are transferred from the kingdom of the world. The devil is the head, and we are moved into the kingdom of God. We become children of God, and we are now safe in that relationship with God. That's the good news, is that we know what? That we are children of God. And it's this picture, really, of a fortress in the midst of great danger. The image that came to my mind in the first service is, have you ever seen this picture of this, this, this lone lighthouse that's standing in the ocean? And there's a huge wave that has broken across this lighthouse. And right at the, at the backside of that wave in this lighthouse is a guy standing right by the door. And the wave is going all around him, but he's completely safe. Why? Because he's on the backside of that edifice that has been constructed to withstand these waves. That's the picture here. Is that, yes, the world around us is opposed to Jesus. The world around us doesn't want to know God. The world around us is a dangerous place. We once were part of that world, but now we have brought into this place of safety and relationship with God. Why? Because we are children of God. He keeps us safe. He keeps us secure. We will not be lost. And this is something we must know, we must hold on to, because it enables us to live freely and confidently in relationship with God. Throughout 1 John, he's talked about this. In 1 John 2, 14, he says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. 1 John 4, 4, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Why? Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We're children of God. We're safe, even though we're in a place of great danger. Because we know Christ, we're his people, we're his kingdom, and he will not be toppled by the world's way. So John starts off in this text, and we see that as Christians, we know that because of our faith in Christ, we're children of God, and we're safe from Satan's harmful ways. He goes on to say, as Christians, we know that Jesus gives us relationship with God, and therefore the hope of eternal life. In 1 John 5, 20, he says, we also know, or we know also, that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. John says, listen, not only do we know we're God's children and we're safe, he says we also know that God's son has come. And, and God's son has given us understanding. The word here is understanding is that we have the mind, if you will, the mind of God. We understand the things that God is doing. And particularly we understand who Jesus is, that he is the true one sent by God. He is God himself in flesh. He is the only one through which we can be saved. He is the one who gives us this safety. And so he says, we know that we know who the Son of God is. We have understanding of who he is. In fact, this word for understanding or mind is the same word that Jesus uses in Mark 12, 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind all your understanding and with all your strength we are able to know god why because he's revealed to us the reality of who christ is he's proven who christ is by who who jesus is and what he's done and what he said and how he proved himself to be who he said he was we have understanding that he wasn't just some guy that spoke a lot of good truths back in the day but that he was god in flesh who spoke the truth of god and made it possible for us to know god by his death and his resurrection this word, understand, or mind, also is the word that Jeremiah uses. When God gives him this beautiful prophecy about how we're going to be able to know God through the Messiah. In Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34, he says, This is the covenant that we live under now, that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. It's the same word for understanding, the mind of God. He gives us the understanding, and he writes it on our hearts. And what is he communicating to us? I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Why? Because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. John here is, is bringing us back to this rich theology of the reality and the presence and the relationship we can have with God through faith in Christ. And he talks about the reality that we understand and we know who Jesus is and that enables us to truly believe and trust in him and have relationship with him where we can know the stuff he's just talked about, that we're safe, that we're children of God, that we have the presence of God in our life, and we have the hope of eternal life. And so this idea of know, of understanding, uh, pulls in then to what Jesus told us about eternal life himself in John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John focuses us back into the reality that all that we know hinges on the reality of the person of Jesus Christ. Without him, we don't have any of these confidences. Without him, we don't know any of these things. Because it's in Jesus, it's in our faith in Christ that we understand this and we live this out in our lives. And the reality is, is that once we understand that faith in Christ brings us true, close relationship with God, then we fully understand what we have there. We start to fully understand what we have there. Is that we sinners can know our Creator personally and intimately and closely. We can know that we have this eternal life because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus' relationship with God provides us hope that God is working in our lives to help us become more like him and follow him. We talked about the really practical reality of knowing God comes in the area of prayer. Right in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, remember we talked about this, it was the idea that he pays attention to us Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. And so this relationship with God that comes through faith in Christ means that we can turn to the Lord in prayer and we can lift up our hearts, our concerns, our wants, and our desires. And what are we guaranteed knowledge of? God hears you. He hears you when you wake up in the morning and you say, I don't think I can get through this day. Or you wake up in the morning and say, I'm excited about this day. And when you go through that day and you're struggling or you're having a great time, you're in God's word, you're not in God's word, he's present with you. When you call out to him, you're guaranteed to know what? He hears you and he's paying attention to what's going on in your life. And he's answering your prayers according to what's best for you and his purposes in this world. That's an amazing gift. And it happens because of Jesus, because of the knowledge he gives us. We saw already that knowing, being in relationship with God means that we're overcoming Satan's temptations and we can obey him. And it enables us to truly love one another as well. In 1 John 3, 16 to 18, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us love not with words or tongue alone, but with actions and in truth. You see, being in relationship with God transforms our ability to relate with God and our knowledge that he cares, that he hears, that he pays attention, that he answers, that he's working, he's transforming us, and we're safe and secure in relationship with him, but it transforms how we relate with one another, that now we live in love with one another, we're concerned about each other, we want to help each other follow the Lord and become more like him. We know God in this way because our faith in Christ Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, John spent a lot of time in this text. Look what he says. And we are in him who is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. John spent a great time in, in his letter here talking about the reality of who Christ is and what he has done. I just want to take us through some of those texts. It starts out in the first three verses. Remember what John says, 1 John 1, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at or we have understood and our hands have touched. This is what we're proclaiming to you, the word of life. John's saying, listen, I am proclaiming to you about this person, Jesus. It's all focused in on Christ. I knew the man. I lived with him. 
I heard what he preached. I saw the miracles that he did. I, I knew that he died on the cross. I saw him at that moment. I took care of his mom. I saw him rise from the dead and talk to him after he was in the grave. This is what I'm proclaiming to you, that this Jesus is real. And he goes on to say, this matters because the life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we're proclaiming to you that the result of it is eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. He says in verse 3, I'm telling you this, what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Very much like John said, Jesus said in John 17, what is the purpose of eternal life that we might have fellowship with God? we might know God. And John starts off his book, and he ends his book pointing us to the reality that who Jesus is matters. Who Jesus is matters. He goes on to talk about the reality that God also testifies to the person of the Holy Spirit to who Jesus is. He says in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. But John says, listen, the Holy Spirit himself testifies to who Jesus is. And he, remember, one of the problems he was dealing with is those who had this heresy that, no, God gives them direct revelation that's detached, removed from the person of Jesus, or goes beyond the teaching of who Jesus is. And he says, listen, I don't care how powerful the experience you have with this spirit is. I don't care what it makes you think you know. If you leave the person of Jesus Christ, you've left the truth. You don't know God anymore. You have walked away from the reality of who God is. And in fact, you are now an antichrist because you are not teaching the truth of who Jesus is and who Jesus is fundamentally and crucially matters for all of this. And then he talks about the reality in 5, 9, and 13 that the Father himself testifies. We accept man's testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is a testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And what is the testimony? God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. And then we come to the great verse that many of us know and we hold on to. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And what is it grounded in? The reality of Jesus Christ and who he was. This person that John ate with, that he, he, he traveled with, he saw preach, he saw the miracles, he saw die, he saw rise again. This Jesus that many of us would testify, as this says as well, that this Jesus isn't dead. He didn't just live 2,000 years, but he's still alive today. And he's spoken to my heart, and the Holy Spirit has testified to the reality, and God's word has pointed to it, and history has proven that he is who he is. This is who we proclaim. This is who we hold on to. This is the essence of the gospel and the message that we have. This week I watched one of these cult videos again. I told you, I watch them. About cults, right? This is weird cult out in California where the guy was really weird. But man, they, he, they loved this fellow, right? He was, created this great community and they, he was like a guru and he taught them all these wonderful things and these people gave up their whole lives, their money, and they lived together and they followed him. This one guy who made this film, for 22 years he followed this guy. They moved all around the country with him. They thought he was God. That he was the one that gave them the truth of God. Well, it turns out he's a complete charlatan. Doing all kinds of terrible things to people in the cult and taking their money and lying and who he was and what his message was. And Do you know how devastated these people were? They gave their whole life to this man. He was a fake. He was a charlatan. He didn't hold up. And John declares, listen, folks, Jesus holds up. He's the truth. He's the life. He gives you eternal life. He, he's not lying to you behind your back and manipulating and abusing and hurting you. No, he is the truth. And he is the only one who's ever come that enables us to truly be in relationship with God. And we hold on to that truth. We believe in that truth. God testifies to that reality. And so John, as he concludes his book, he says, listen, you can know that you're children of God. You're safe from Satan's harm. And you can know that you're God's children. Why? Because of who Jesus is and what he has done and what he is doing and the truth of who he is in your relationship with him. 
And then John concludes his book in chapter 5, verse 21. And his point is that as Christians, we know that false teaching and idols don't give us eternal life. He comes very clear to an end here. He says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. It's an odd ending. And most of those who've studied Scripture and look at this, have some of them even said, well, maybe there's more that got lost throughout human history because all of a sudden he introduces this idea of idols. He's never talked about idols before. And now his final statement is, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. What do you think John is trying to communicate here? I think he's trying to communicate to us his one last parting encouragement. And he even writes it in his, his, his typical way to address something he's very concerned about. He says, Dear children, those I love and I care about, keep yourselves from idols. What is he trying to communicate to us? He's saying, listen, you know the truth of who Christ is. I have testified to it. I have shown you how God testifies to it. I have warned you about those who will try to lead you astray from it. And so he says, listen, pay attention. You live in a world that is dangerous. And you're going to be tempted to walk away from the truth that you know. So his final encouragement is, listen, be aware. Be alert. Be cautious. This idea of keep yourselves is a defensive posture. To take steps necessary to realize that yes, you're, you're going to be and you are in relationship with God. You will go into eternity with God. You have relationship with God, but Satan can still damage. He can still harm. He can still interrupt fellowship. He can draw others away and keep people from knowing Christ. And so he says, be aware. Keep yourselves from idols. How do we be defensive? How do we stay safe? First, we hold firm to the doctrine of who God is and who Christ is. We never waver on that. I love these songs we sang this morning because they focus us in on the reality of Jesus and what he's done. We read that creed because as I was going through this and thinking about this, I thought these are the truths that we must fundamentally hold on to because they enable us to know God and be in relationship with him. So the way we stay safe from idols is first and foremost to always keep the truth of who God is in our minds. Second line is we need to recognize the dangers to temptation to sin. What are the areas in which I am more susceptible to give in to sin than others? You know, there are some things that I'm very tempted by. There's other stuff. I think you could put a thing of cocaine in my room, and I'd just be like, is it flour? Is it sugar? I'm not putting that up my nose. I don't have any temptation to take cocaine. I got lots of temptation to do other stuff. The reality is, is I need to be aware of, if a drug dealer comes into my life and says, I don't even know what the going rate is, I'm like, okay, I'm, no, go away. Maybe I should call the police even. Should I call the police? Probably should call the police. But the reality is I'm not tempted by that. But I need to know what I'm tempted by. And I need to be aware of that. I need to understand that my flesh still wars at times against the Lord. The culture around us wants to tempt us away from the Lord. The devil is active and aware, and he wants to tempt us. And so we need to be aware of the idols that we potentially can give in to. And when we do sin, that we confess quickly to it. That when we give in to the temptation, when we give in to an idol in our life, our response is not, maybe it's not such a big deal. Did God really say I shouldn't do that? No, our response is to say, I did what God said I shouldn't do. It's wrong. I shouldn't have done it. It's not what God wants. I confess that what I did was not right. And Lord, I need your forgiveness because of Jesus. And I'm grateful that you've given it to me. And Lord, I want to obey and follow you. And I want to turn away from this garbage in my life. And I know how stupid and destructive it is. Help me to turn from it. Quick to confess, quick to repent of those sins. We also need to pray for God to help us to truly understand who he is, that we would see how beautiful and true and good and how we can have this assurance in our knowledge of him. And we need to pray for each other as well, that God would help us. Remember a couple of weeks, I guess just last week, we talked about when we see our brother and sister sinning, what do we do? We pray, and what do we do? We ask for God to give them life that they would not be blinded by the sin in their lives, not be blinded by the sin in this world, but come quickly to repentance and trust in Christ and become more like him. We also are defensive against the temptations of idols in our life by loving our fellow Christians and helping each other with our needs, be they physical or spiritual, to recognize that, listen, I'm called to help care for you, and you're called to help, help care for me, that we have a role to play in each other's lives, to encourage each other to love and follow Jesus, that when we do see each other sinning, to pray and maybe take other steps to help each other in that process of repentance and becoming more like Jesus. We keep ourselves from idols 
And fundamentally, it comes from recognizing the reality of God's work in us. And once again, looking at his love and his grace and his mercy that we might respond out of obedience and love to him. And so I think John finishes this. Dear children, keep yourselves in idols is a way sort of for us to think about who do I really serve and follow in this world? Here he's just gone through this beautiful book, this letter to this church, where he's proclaimed the highest and most glorious truths of who God is and how it changes our lives and gives us relationship with God and keeps us safe in the future of hope of eternity with God completely unhindered by sin and its effects and what glorious reality that is and he says keep those things in mind and be aware of the lies of the world around you so that you don't give in to the lesser things in this world and so in a sense perhaps his final challenge is sort of a rhetorical flourish if you will that challenges us to say do we know love and follow Jesus or do we know love and follow the idols of this world when we leave this building, are we going to know, love, and follow Christ? Or are we going to be tempted to turn away from his ways and truth? Who do we really serve? Who's our king? Who's our master? Who's our Lord? Dear children, you know all of this. Don't give in to the garbage. Don't give in to the lies. Don't give in to the destructive things in this world. Because they never deliver what they promise. Think about alcoholics that I've known none of them have said oh it's great they've all sat across the table from me and said it destroyed everything I held dear in my life everything and yet I wanted it so bad it's a lie it's an idol in our life that we, we think will cope and if yours isn't alcohol maybe it's sexual promiscuity if yours isn't that maybe it's the pursuit of wealth and, and, and happiness through making a lot of money and success and power folks you get there and you realize it's nothing it's a lie. It's deception. And John's final encouragement to us is, listen, in Christ you have all of God's attention and love and care and truth. Don't throw that off. Keep firm. Keep strong. Keep believing. Keep hoping. Because that's where real life is found. Just bow with me in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this wonderful book, this letter that you encouraged and inspired and enabled John to write to these churches long ago and that still speaks to us today so powerfully. Lord, thank you for the beautiful encouragement and the hope that it gives that we can know you. We can know we're your children. That we can know the truth and find true life in you. Lord, help us to daily seek you to desire to love you more, to follow you more faithfully. That we would know that you love us, you hear us, you pay attention to us, you provide for our needs. Lord, help us never to be fooled by our flesh and our cultures and the evil one, to give in to lesser things that never provide what they promise. And Lord, when we do, we would once again turn to you quickly to confess and receive all the forgiveness that you have for us. Thank you that through faith in Christ we're always yours. And what you want for us is best and beautiful and good. So Lord, help us to obey, to follow, to live, to enjoy who you are and what you're doing in and through us. Pray these things in